Hello everyone and welcome to module 7. This module is going to be all about storytelling and once again in the context of copywriting and sales messages. The world of storytelling is something that you could learn for months and years, even a lifetime. There's people who've dedicated their entire lives to the craft, whether they're film directors or novelists or uh, play actors. Any type of person who tells a story is going to constantly be learning more and practicing being a, good, be, being a better storyteller, being a good storyteller in the first place. So today's module is not designed to teach you every single thing you need to know about storytelling. Today we're just going to talk about what is relevant to you as a copywriter and what is relevant to you when you're building sales messages for yourself, for your clients, and for businesses. Now. I'm going to go through a couple things here and some of the things I'm going to talk about you or other people may disagree with and so what I'm going to do is do my best to justify what I'm talking about with these stories and then show you exactly how I view writing copy and storytelling. So here's what we're going to cover. We're going to cover five different things. The first we're going to talk about is the hero's journey. And the hero's journey is something you've inevitably run into if you're familiar with storytelling at all. And I'm going to go over it. I'm going to talk about it in detail because it does deserve a huge module or a huge part of the module. But we're also going to talk about the myth of the hero's journey right after that. Then we're going to dive into archetypes, which are the different types of characters and story types that you can use. We're going to talk about the foundations of good story and we're going to talk specifically about how to build your story, whether it's in your own products or your client's products. You can follow a specific process to building the right story. So without further ado, this is going to be similar to previous modules where we're going to be looking at the slides and the content on the left. And then whenever appropriate, we are going to be looking at uh, live examples on the internet on the right. So let's dive in. Let's talk about what the hero's journey is. So the hero's journey looks something like this. It is a circular type of story that always follows, follows the same steps. Usually there are 12 steps. There's people that define them differently or call them different names, but this is what it looks like. And so what we're going to do here is actually expand this out so you guys can see specifically what we're talking about, and I'll use the mouse to talk about specific pieces. So the hero's journey starts at zero starts with a character in a setting that is normal, is relatable, or is very mundane and nothing special about it. Then when you set that setting and you talk about your main character and you've, you've attached the audience to that character in some way, that character experiences what is called a call to adventure. So the call to adventure is an event that happens in the hero's life that is out of the ordinary and is essentially beckoning that hero to go out into the world and do something different, do something better, to become the actual hero. Now, before this call to adventure happens, this person is not a hero. Only by virtue of the fact that you're reading a story about them do you even know that this person has anything special about them in general. If you just looked at them on the street, you wouldn't notice anything different. They can be an average Joe, they can be an average Jane, whoever that person is. They are living in their ordinary world. They're an ordinary, unremarkable person. The more relatable you can make the quote-unquote hero or the character of your story to your target market in copywriting, the better. Because if they look exactly like they look, or your, your prospect looks, then they're going to bond with them quicker and easier. This call to adventure, and we'll just talk about the hero's journey in general right here, and then we'll talk about how it refers to copywriting. But the call to adventure is an event that happens that is propelling or beckoning the hero of the story to go to a better place or to start on an adventure or to start something. What happens next is the refusal of the call. So this is when the hero in their ordinary life, in their ordinary situation, does not answer the call to adventure. They, they receive an opportunity, they receive an, a, a notice, an event of some sort, and they refuse the call. So 
they they do this for any number of reasons. Maybe they're afraid. Maybe they ignore it because they don't think it's special. You know, there's something about it that don't, that they don't like. But at the end of the day, the result is the same, and that hero refuses the call to adventure. Now, one of the most important things about this call to or refusing the call is that there is a consequence to refusing the call, and that consequence is almost always negative. In fact, in any good story, you'll notice that the consequence is extremely negative to refusing the call. And when that happens, the hero is jolted, physically jolted, out of their ordinary world because of this negative consequence and this uh, refusal of the call to adventure. So what happens after that consequence is typically they meet some sort of mentor, some sort of guide, and that guide is going to take them through the journey of the hero's journey. So what we have so far is an ordinary person in an ordinary world receives some sort of beckoning to adventure. They refuse it and experience a massive negative consequence. And because of that negative consequence, they inevitably meet a mentor or a guide that is going to help them through the rest of the journey. The next step is called crossing the threshold. So crossing the threshold is when the hero moves from their ordinary world, their old world, into the new special world. And this is a world of adventure, a world of discovery, a world of outside the norm and usually outside of the comfort zone of the hero and therefore your audience. They don't know what to expect and this is part of the adventure and the interestingness of the story. The next part of the hero's journey is when they encounter tests, allies, and enemies. So the tests, allies, and enemies stage of things can be any number of events that happen in this special world that challenge the hero or that show the hero there are specific other characters or villains involved in their journey. So this is showing allies, showing um, people who are part of the cause, trying to defeat the same enemy. Uh, and will eventually help the hero through their quest. The enemies are going to bring bring up challenges. They're going to bring up obstacles for the hero to overcome. And the tests themselves are more like physical environment or external things that aren't controlled by either the allies or the enemies, but still challenge the hero. And moving on from those things, and those things happen interspersed. So there's not just one instance of these. These happen all throughout the special world. And... What happens next is called the approach. The approach is when the hero has undergone some tests, they've defeated some enemies, found new ones, found allies, lost allies, all that kind of stuff. But now they are approaching the final quote unquote uh, destination. This is the Mount Doom for Lord of the Rings. This is the Excalibur for King Arthur. You know, this is something where the hero is approaching the final challenge of what they have to encounter on their journey and it's arduous and they have to go through it and usually they fall back a few steps and things happen. So this final challenge is a big ordeal for them to go through. That's why the next part, number eight, is the ordeal, the death, and the rebirth. So the ordeal is the actual dealing with the final challenge. And it's truly challenging. It, it tests the hero to their absolute breaking point and then the hero breaks. So they either die metaphorically, they die physically and come back, but something happens where the old person that was born in this ordinary world is dead and a new person emerges from that experience. So whether it's literal or figurative or metaphorical, this is the turning point of the special world and this is the entire reason for the hero's journey. The hero's journey exists to take an ordinary person and turn them into something brand new and better through trial. That is what the hero's journey is all about. Once they've gone through this and they re they're reborn as the new entity, they go down and they receive a reward. And whatever that reward is, is irrelevant because it focuses on the, the idea of receiving something after undergoing trial. Once they've undergone trial, then that trial is going to be part of their psyche, part of who they are as a person. And part of that trial, part of that reward is going to be brought back with them to the ordinary world, to where they were before they answered the call to adventure. So 
the call to adventure or the call to adventure leads through all of these trials they're reborn they receive reward and they they start moving back to where they originally were the road back oftentimes is still fraught with some danger that nothing is you know it's not perfect anymore but for the most part the new hero can challenge or can challenge any of the things that come up against them and, and overcome them relatively easily, which is part of the reward to becoming the hero. Once they pass through the membrane of the special world into the ordinary world again, then there's a, sort of a comeuppance or a new rebirth for the ordinary world. Because before the hero transformed, there was issues with the ordinary world. There was something wrong. There was something pervasive about what the ordinary world was all about. And by becoming the hero and overcoming the trials, the hero essentially transforms his older world. And part of that is returning with the secret gift or the, or the special sauce or whatever it happens to be. So this entire journey is designed to show and tell a story of an ordinary person who receives an extraordinary charge, goes through ordeals and transforms into being a bigger, better person, reaps the reward of that transformation, and then comes back to change his old world for the better. That is the hero's journey in a nutshell. And so you can see how a lot of stories that you've read, both fictionally and for sales copy, follow a very, very similar methodology to this. Average person receives a reason for acting, may suffer consequences for not acting, they meet some sort of guide or mentor, they go through pain and trial, they go through tests, they find allies, they find enemies, they approach their final destination or their final challenge, they are transformed by that challenge, they reap a reward, and they go back to their ordinary life transformed. You can see how this is a sales piece but also a story that everybody understands. This is something that every human will pick up on because it's ingrained in us to believe this type of story. So let's go and talk a little bit about the details of this. So this first came out. Uh, this has obviously been told for thousands and thousands of years, but the first person who's been credited with truly synthesizing this and putting it together is Joseph Campbell and in his book The Hero with a Thousand Faces. If you want a full like, you know, philosophical and academic view of the hero's journey, I would highly recommend going to get this book because it's going to give you the the source material. Everybody else is is taking this material and and mixing it into their own understanding. So this is the source. Start with this if you really want to know what it's all about. But Essentially, you can split the hero's journey into three special acts. The first act is the ordinary world, the call to adventure, the refusal and consequences, the meeting of the mentor, and the crossing of the threshold. So this is what happens in the first part of the story, and this is what people expect to, to feel when they're going through the first part of your sales message. Now, think about this from the terms of a copywriter. If you have three videos to make, how are you going to split them up? You're going to split them up with the three acts. Or you're going to split them up with a sales message that adheres to the three acts. So there are other ways to do this too. Do you have five messages? Okay, well, okay, include act one, ordinary world, call to adventure, and refusal in the first one. There's a, a natural cliffhanger built in. Then the second one is meeting the mentor, crossing the threshold. The third one is tests and allies and enemies. The fourth one is approaching the cave and the ordeal. And the fifth one is the reward in the promised land. All built-in cliffhangers and open loops so that people will have the right story. You can break this up into whatever type of sales message you need. If you have to write 10 emails, then you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 different topics for those emails whatever you have to do. You could split those up as well because each of these is its own story, its own chapter, even its own section. So don't be afraid to mix and match all of these things, but understand that the core premise needs to be followed. You can't start with an ordinary world and then skip down to resurrection and then go back to the ordeal. It doesn't work that way. Humans think this way because we've been conditioned sociologically and physiologically to understand this story and believe in it. It's how we communicated for thousands of years before we even had words to write things down or letters and alphabet, things like that. So act one, 
These five pieces, Ordinary World, Call to Adventure, Refusal, and the Consequences, Meeting the Mentor and Crossing the Threshold. Act two, the Tests and Allies, Approaching the Cave, the Ordeal, the Reward, and the Road Back. And act three is the Resurrection of the ori Original World and the Return with the Elixir to help the original world be better. That is the three-act version of the hero's journey. Now, let's talk about what I call the myth of the hero's journey. So the myth of the hero's journey, in my opinion as a copywriter, is that the hero's journey is the only way to tell a story. You're going to hear that certain epics were built with the hero's journey in mind. And the hero's journey is something you can attribute to almost every story you've ever read, especially in fiction or common ones that you see. And so it's natural to think that the hero's journey is the only way to write a story. But in reality, the hero's journey is an extremely small component to an overarching idea of storytelling. It's something that our brains naturally understand, but at the same time, we crave something different. So in Star Wars, you can see the natural progression of Star Wars with Luke Skywalker. When he starts his journey in the ordinary world, he receives a call to adventure when he is told, hey, you should join up with the Imperial fleet or you should fly for them. He's like, no, or the droids show up and say, we need your help going somewhere. And he says, I refuse. And then he refuses the call, and his adopted parent, his adopted parents, his uncle and his aunt, are murdered by the Imperial stormtroopers. He meets his mentor in Obi Wan Kenobi. He crosses the threshold by leaving Tatooine. He encounters tests and allies and enemies with Han Solo and Darth Vader and tests of his own skill in becoming a Jedi. He approaches Darth Vader in the previous uh, videos. He, or in the, in the next part of the videos, he goes through an ordeal. He loses his hand. He dies by falling off and becoming reborn by getting a prosthetic limb uh, as a robot hand. He goes through more ordeals, more tests, finally defeating the... Uh, not only the Emperor, but Darth Vader, and getting the reward of rebuilding the world, and then starts his road back and goes back to uh, goes back with his sister and resurrects the world and rebuilds the Republic and returns with the Force, the good side of the Force that has been destroyed by Darth Vader and the Emperor beforehand. The hero's journey is very classic in Star Wars. Now. What I do want to talk about is some of the realities. So well, you can see the hero's journey in all three of these. The Star Wars hero's journey is, is there in Conan, if uh, Conan, however you want to pronounce it, especially in Schwarzenegger's version of the original Conan, you can see the hero's journey there. He, he is a youth, he is put into a trial, he starts his adventure, his call to adventure, he refuses, there are consequences, and his journey keeps going through and eventually he becomes the one to destroy the Snake King or whatever it was. And on and on and on. Harry Potter is the same way. You know, he started in an ordinary world. He receives the call to adventure from Hogwarts as to be a wizard. He refuses, but not on his own power because his uh, his uncle or his family is refusing to let him. He crosses the threshold literally with Hagrid where he, they click on the Diagon Alley button and he walks through into Diagon Alley into the wizarding world and so on and so on. You can see the hero's journey here. But I want to talk about the reality and why I say that there's a myth in the hero's journey. Because with Star Wars, it's not so simple as the normal hero's journey. Because when you look at this, you see, oh, Luke Skywalker starts here and goes around in the circle and returns with the elixir. But what about the prequels? Why did it start with episode five rather than episode one? I'm sorry, episode four. Uh, episode four, five, and six. Why did it start in the middle of the story? Why did it start with Luke Skywalker walking on a Tatooine and not with Anakin Skywalker if they're just going to start all over? Okay, so something else is going on here. 
There is a ring theory to Star Wars that essentially says that there are interlocking stories that bleed through and you can see when you look at it. Actually, let's look on the internet and show you this. This is a little bit of nerdy stuff going on, but you can see how complex stories get very quickly. Ring Theory Star Wars. This actually went viral, uh, especially around Star Wars nerds, but the concept being that we are delving into a level of sophistication in storytelling that most people don't give credit for in the hero's journey. So we're looking at this. Maybe George Lucas had a bigger idea for his six and that's why he started. So let's look at this in detail. This on the left hand side is the beginning scene from episode one. This on the right hand side is the beginning scene from episode five, I believe. You can see the comparisons in the different episodes and how the introductions are very similar. You can also see this happen over and over again in the entire series. And so something much deeper than the, ring th or than the traditional hero's journey is happening here. And I use this point not to be a total nerd, but to illustrate that story is so much deeper. And so you can't just say that Star Wars was a good hero's journey executed correctly and that's why it was so successful. But in fact, the, the deeper and more involved the story idea gets, the better things perform. Because a natural hero's journey is something we've seen so often, especially now in our world of constant entertainment. We no longer have that appeal that we normally have when we hear it. But when we see something different or something cool or something deeper, we perk up and we notice it. And as a copywriter, that's incredibly important. You want that person to perk up and look and notice and see what is going on differently. The next part in Conan is what I call the serializer. So instead of one story that's following the hero's journey and then it's over, a serializer is a continuous story. You see this with soap operas. There is no hero's journey in Game of Thrones. There is no hero's journey in Gotham. There's no hero's journey in any of these TV shows. The reason being, we get bored with the hero's journey. We've heard of it. We've retired of it. And so if your sales message sounds like a typical hero's journey, we've heard it before. Everybody's seen the same thing. How can you change it? That's what I'm about to show you. And that's why we're diving into the myth of the hero's journey and what the re reality is. Harry Potter is an example of what I would call a saga. A saga is a hero's journey, but it is extended over a long period of time and it goes through multiple iterations. So it doesn't look like this circle anymore. It starts to look like a chain link fence. It starts to look like a Celtic knot. And the reason for that is because it adds complexity. It adds emotional attachment to everything and it allows you to sink yourself into the story. And it's different from a serializer because the saga you know has an end. Just like Game of Thrones is a somewhat of a saga, there is no hero's journey cyclically happening in every single one of the books. There's a continued story that uses these elements to great effect, but completely jumbles them up and doesn't use them in the circle like you're supposed to. So keep that in mind. And one of the resources I wanted to bring up in this call is a site called tvtropes.org. Let's go there real quick. Sometimes it takes a while to load simply because it's such a big site. But tvtropes.org is, is a place where you can go as a storyteller and a copywriter to completely redefine the type of story that you're going to tell. Let me, let me show you. It doesn't look like much, but let's dive in to some of the some of the wonderful things we can find here. Now, like I said, it's a little slow because it's a big site, but let's look at what we got. We can browse different types of tropes. Now, if you're not sure what a trope is, a trope is just a uh, mechanism of storytelling. So it's something that you would immediately recognize when told what it is. The absent-minded professor. You immediately have a mental image of what an absent-minded professor looks like. Food pills. That futuristic idea of popping a a pill into a microwave in the future and getting an immediate meal from the Jetsons, you know what that means. The uh, Megaton punch, something where it's a huge punch and they go flying. You would understand these and see these because you've seen entertainment so much, so that's what the tropes are all about. 
And these, this site has every single one of them. Now, why does that help you as a copywriter? Because you can go in here and create a story, create a pitch, create an idea that uses these tropes in a creative new way because there are literally thousands of them. And because of that, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of different combinations that you can create in a new and exciting story. All you have to remember is that because people remember the hero's journey and want to be part of it, as long as you're keeping these things in mind when you're telling your story and making your prospect the hero of the story, then you can basically show them whatever you want. So I would highly recommend bopping around on TV tropes, maybe even going to Story Generator and just hitting, hitting new batch. With this one, you have a setting of an ancient, uh, an advanced ancient Acropolis, which instead of the normal world is an advanced or is a advanced but ancient world where the hero is sitting there, and so their normal is completely foreign to what most people are used to, which immediately draws them in and has attention. What would that mean for you? If you're marketing to an American audience, you can use that. At, you can use a Japanese person as an interesting trope. Say how this uh, this Japanese person had a discovery in his homeland or it's found ancient wisdom buried deep in, uh, in a temple with a bunch of monks that led him to discover this method for earning $10,000 a day or whatever you wanna do. You can see the connections here that immediately create interest and attention and allow you to tell positive, really engaging stories. Now, let's jump back in here and talk about the uh, different things about different stories. So again, TV tropes, highly recommend you jump in there and just start playing around with it. But let's talk about what stories are. Stories are communication, pure and simple. Human beings do not do well with logic. We don't do well with blocks of text. We don't do well with lectures, all that kind of st reading. We just don't do well with bricks of information. However, what we do incredibly well is listen to and remember stories and the components of stories. All you have to do is look at some of the election going on or some of the conversations going on around politics around the world and see who's being most successful with the most amount of people. They tend to be the people who are telling the best stories, using the best metaphors, communicating in idioms and parables and proverbs on how things need to be. It's not the people with the facts who capture attention. It's the people with the stories who capture attention. And as a copywriter, you want to show all the facts. You want to show all the benefits to your product. You want to convince them through sheer power of logic that, that your product is superior. But I guarantee you could take the best researcher with a team of faculty behind him to find every single shred of evidence to buy a particular product and put them all together with a template for a sales letter and then have them compete against one master storyteller. And that storyteller will destroy the researchers every single time because people don't learn and don't act because of data and logic. They learn and act because of emotion and storytelling. So keep this in mind. Stories are communication. And the best way to do that is through metaphor, through common idioms, whatever your target market appeals to or understands, and parables and proverbs that they already know. So if you're dealing with a conservative audience, they often have very good knowledge of Christian parables. So if you communicate to them with parables or with proverbs that are going on with their core, then they automatically know what you're talking about and you don't have to provide a massive amount of proof to convince them that uh, money is the root of all evil, or that it's harder for the rich man to pass through the eye of, or it is harder for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter heaven. There's lots of these parables that this conservative audience would understand and believe way before you told them that you know 90% of people with wealth over $150,000 end up losing their wealth by the end of their life. That doesn't matter to them, but the story does. So keep that in mind. Now, the next thing I want to tell you about 
with the, the myth of the hero's journey is that there is no sandbox. There is no specific template to telling a story. If you use this as a rough guide, a very rough guide, and you use TV tropes or any other type of story stuff that you find, you can tell the story however you want. You can have the hero fail and die and then somebody takes their place and that person learns the lesson they need to or whatever you have to do. I mean, look at Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones ha is thrown the rulebook out completely and just kills off every one of their favorite characters. Luckily, the show writers now realize that their ratings are going to go down if they keep killing the best characters. And so the last seasons have, been, have seen some success and not a whole lot of relevant deaths. But Game of Thrones is completely thrown the rulebook out and now they are the biggest show on television. And this isn't just about entertainment, it's about attention. It's about the idea that the person you are communicating with wants to be entertained. They wanna be sucked out of their boredom and thrown into a world that not only promises their paradise that they want, but also promise them, promises them freedom from the pains that they're currently experiencing in their life and the the hopes and dreams that they have and the fears and they want to be put into this world but they don't want to do it through logic and they don't want to do it through facts they want to do it through story so keep that in mind but also remember like i've taught you in this course there is no sandbox i want to teach you principles i want to teach you big overall strategies and I want to teach you the ability to have the confidence in yourself to go out and freaking test something or tell a story. Because if you can do that, those are the things that win. It's not some secret template that the gurus are hiding from you that works every single time because that's never existed. The If you'll notice, every single time they sell a new template, the sales message looks different even though the idea of it is the same, that if you buy this thing, you'll succeed. The reason for that is because they're changing their story in order to meet what the market wants. That's all copywriting is, and that's what I hope to teach you with this module, and why I think storytelling is so powerful in general for copywriters. Now, let's move on. Let's talk about archetypes. So archetypes exist, and there are dozens of them that you can probably name off the top of your head. And there are hundreds of them that you would immediately recognize as archetypes. You can see that here in TV tropes, where if we go to browse, then you're going to see all sorts of random stuff. Like, let me just hit the random button and it'll come back in. The badass long coat, the blood from the mouth to know that you're sick. All these archetypes, even just people, macho disaster expedition, um, <laughs> Cosby show, mutants. There's so many archetypes of stories that you can tell that people will immediately get because they've seen this stuff before. So don't think that you have to be stuck with the ones that I'm about to tell you. There are so many of them. However, there are some common ones that people relate to in some ways, in, in better ways than others. So let's look at this one. There are some common ones. I think, um, yeah, so I'll go over some of the Jungian um, archetypes here, but I want to talk about some common ones for internet marketing that you're going to see a lot. The first one is the reluctant hero. The reluctant hero is kind of like a Russell Brunson character where he's he's a guy that um, you know, kind of stumbled on marketing, you know, he just worked real hard, or but, but he never really just started out being a marketer. He's just kind of this guy that keeps stumbling on stuff. He's the, he's the reluctant person who's basically saying, you know, I didn't like go to school to learn all this stuff. I'm not a super expert or anything like that. I'm just someone who keeps finding cool stuff and I'm sharing it with you and I'm excited to share it with you, but you know, it was never my thing to be this type of person. That's his archetype. That's what he sells as. The next one would be like a journalist, someone who goes out and finds information and relays it to people. And that information is usually something that the person couldn't find on their own. Journalists are renowned and known for digging into stuff and finding things other people can't find and doing that investigation. So they're respected 
because they do the work that people don't want to do to find the information that people need. So as, uh, as an example, Mike Dillard is one of those, especially when he started his company, The Elevation Group, where his tagline was showing you inside the black box secrets, investing secrets of the rich. So he went as a journalist and found people who but were both extremely wealthy, but also assisted people who were extremely wealthy and mined them for their results and for what they were doing differently than the common investor hugely compelling to his target market when you do that because everybody believes the rich have a better idea of what's going on than the common person and honestly it's a true belief so when you get a chance to buy into it for a hundred dollars a month or six hundred dollars a year you do it immediately and he was very successful i think his company did two uh twenty million dollars in its first year the next one would be hometown boy made good this is frank kern you know, he's your buddy, he's your pal, he's the guy you grew up next to, and you know, he's just he's just a fun-loving guy, he's really laid back, but he found some cool stuff, and he just wants to teach you some cool stuff. Even when I describe Frank Kern, you can hear Frank Kern in my voice. Hey, this is really cool, I just taught this, you know, I just learned this really cool thing and I wanted to share it with you, so just throw your email in here and I'll share it with you super quick. That's Frank Kern. That's the hometown boy made good. He's the guy you recognize from your high school, but you also like think, oh wow, you know, if he can do it, I can do it. You know, if he knows something, I'll 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 listen to him. I'll 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 try this out. Hometown boy made good works really really well for the market if you're marketing to people who are average or you know mainstream America that kind of thing. I'm gonna take a sip of water real quick. Next one is the sage. So the sage is the wise man, the, the guy on top of the mountain. And the sage is best exemplified right now in terms of internet marketing people that you and I will recognize as Eben Pagan. Eben Pagan positions himself as an expert, positions himself as a guru, potentially one of the original gurus. And um, you know he taught Mike Dillard, he taught Russell Brunson, he taught Frank Kern. He's the guy who started a lot of people. And that sage-like mentality is something that people approach him for. They know he's one with wisdom. They know he's someone who usually is on the cutting edge and knows the principles but also the advanced stuff. So following Evan Pagan is following that wisdom, and he's positioned himself to be that in every single one of his products. You can see these in many other people as well, but the idea of having an archetype is that a person can immediately attribute an idea of who you are and what you're going to offer without you having to explain it to them. It's this subconscious connection to these archetypes that we already understand that is the most powerful thing about storytelling and about using the archetypes. So when you tap into that subconscious understanding, especially if you know who your target market is and how they're going to perceive you given your, your title, your archetype, then you have much more power over them when you're crafting your sales message. When you read a sales message from Frank Kern, you trust Frank Kern, unless you've been hurt by him in the past or something, but normally because of his tone and his positioning and his archetype, you trust him. So when he writes a sales letter and he's being cool about stuff and he offers you something to pay, you know, offers to pay him, then you're gonna be like, yeah, I, I trust Frank, absolutely. You know, Frank's a good guy, Frank's just like me. Or a journalist like Mike Dillard. Mike Dillard goes, hey, I did all this research, man. I went into the depths and found all of this really important stuff, and I want to share it with you now, but I can't share it with just everyone, so you have to pay me money. And he's like, yeah, absolutely, I'll pay you for that. I definitely want to learn how billionaires invest their money. The reluctant hero is like, well, man, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't anything special, but here he is sharing this stuff, and he just discovered it, so why not? Why wouldn't I listen to him? And the sage is obvious, you know, the wisdom that you want to pull from someone who's been there, done that. So these are the common ones. Let's talk a little bit about some resources that you can use. Um, one of the best, more modern resources I know of is Sally Hogshead, and she has her fascination types. So this is better for you as a marketer and as a copywriter to kind of position yourself to go and take a fascination type quiz where it shows you what your primary and secondary fascination types are. And all that means is it's a personality test that shows you how other people view you. And when you do that, you can kind of get an idea for 
what type of person people perceive you to be and how you can leverage your strengths. I'm really big into leveraging your strengths as a copywriter and I don't like trying to be something you're not. So for me, uh, personally, I edge towards the sage simply because I'm more of an academic and more of a researcher. I'm not the hometown boy made good. I, you know, I never you know, played on the football team or anything like that. I could be a journalist if I wanted to, but I like teaching more so than I like researching. And so the sage is a better one for me. And with Sally Hogshead, if you go take her quiz with the fascination types, then you'll quickly see that there are multiple different types of things you can be. In my case, when I took hers, I was the ace. And the ace is the person with the answers, the ace is the person with the plan, and that's the type of person that people perceive me to be, and so I just leverage my strengths and I teach things uh, from that perspective, from that kind of authoritative but also heavily researched and heavily respected uh, position. That's what I try to go for. If that's not your personality or if that's something that doesn't resonate with you, then you can teach from or, or write from a different perspective just as easily. There's no better or worse to any of this. It's just what you are strongest at and what your skills are. So let's talk about Carl Jung. Now, if you're in the world of psychology or uh, psychotherapy or anything like that, you've heard of Carl Jung before because he's kind of the grandfather of these um, methods for psychotherapy and for dream analysis and things like that. But we're not going to go super deep into Carl Jung. Today, we're just going to talk about his archetypes. And Carl Jung has specific archetypes that he has found when dealing with people's subconsciouses. And this is what, like, you see, you see people associating ideas of people with. You know, we kind of have these boxes in our head of what people are like. Well, these are those boxes. And these are the things that most people pull from when they're creating their personality tests or whatever their personal IP is. I'm sure Sally Hogshead pulled from this and put her own spin on things just like everyone else does. So I'm going to talk about all these and I'm not going to go into super, super deep detail, but I am going to link them with the feeling or the primal desire, primal fear, whatever you want, and also a brand that does it really well. So the first one is the innocent. So the innocent archetype exemplifies simplicity. And simplicity is really appealing for a lot of people because we don't like to think as hard as, as people say they do. So simplicity is huge and simplicity and ease and the, uh, the simple life, all that kind of stuff. One of the brands that does this best is McDonald's. You, you get what you get with McDonald's. It's simple. You know what it tastes like. You ate it as a kid. It's something that you can relate to that level of innocence and simplicity. And unless you're really against McDonald's as a fast food company like some markets are, you know, like the health market and things like that, then you're going to perceive McDonald's as the innocent. And that's just the brand that they've undertaken. So the next example, or the next archetype is the hero. Now the hero exemplifies triumph and victory. So when the hero arrives, that's the feeling you get when you win. And so this can be put onto anyone. If you played sports as a kid, you know what it's like to win. If you played video games as a kid, you know what it's like to beat a level. If you were a debater or if you were a uh, star at the, you know, at for, you know, on stage, whatever you were, you've probably felt triumph at some point in your life. And the bre the brand the brand that I can talk about with that best exemplifies that right now is Under Armour because all of their ads speak to triumph, speak to winning, you know, own this house or defend this house, that kind of thing. That's the hero talking. The next one is the regular guy. The regular guy corresponds to obviously the um, reluctant hero and even the hometown boy made good. So the regular guy here exemplifies the sense of belonging, you know, the sense of being together with people. And being out with your friends, being in your hometown, you know, your high school girlfriend, whatever it happens to be, it's this kind of nostalgic feel of belonging with your friends. And the best brand to do that right now, or one of the best brands, is Bud Light. That all of their ads are centered around being out with your buds. So you can see that in their advertising and you can see the archetype in the regular guy. Next one is the nurturer. So the nurturer is all about, interestingly enough, recognition and praise, things like that. Because 
the nurturer is the person, the, the mother figure or the um, the company that, that basically gives you the appreciation that most people lack. Most people really f need appreciation for their actions. They need to feel wanted and desired. So instead, not in a sexual way, but in, in just an appreciative way. So it's that feeling of having a mother or that feeling of having success but being recognized for it that exemplifies the nurturer. Now, to some extent, this is Ford because Ford has this brand around um, the strength of Ford or like the, uh, you know, like a rock or being really dependable, that kind of thing. So this sense of stability that is necessary for this archetype resounds with Ford. Now, you can obviously think of other ones like um, Pampers, the the diaper company is obviously a nurturing company and other brands directed at mothers for obvious reasons are nurturing companies simply because you know as a mom you want to be a you want to be appreciated for your own stuff but you also know that you are the nurturer and you are the person that uh, takes care of your children in that regard also dads but uh, heavily directed towards women and moms so the next one would be the creator now the creator is all about authenticity and artistic expression. And the creator is all about being authentic for themselves and being able to display that to the world. That's really key. The creator cannot create in a box. They have to create in front of people. And it's really important for people to be seen as a creator when they are a creator. Otherwise, most creators don't sit in their bedrooms and draw stuff themselves and never want to show anyone. And if they do, it's because because they have a deep-seated fear or low self-esteem, but in their heart of hearts, they want people to see it. These are the people who, if they're hiding in their rooms, want to be found. They're the people who might muster up the courage to go practice or to go sing on the voice or uh, dance with the stars or something like that. These are the people who want to be found but don't necessarily have the courage to be authentic out front. Best brand for this one is Apple. You can see it very obviously. It's marketed towards creatives and individuals who want to stand out. So the next one is the Explorer, which is obvious, exemplifies freedom, exemplifies travel and moving around and being associated with adventure. So the adventure there, uh, best brand for that is GoPro for obvious reasons. You know, all of their advertising is just some of their uh, awesome videos that their customers send in from doing really cool stuff. But the Explorer brand is there for that sense of freedom in everyone. So if you want to market a lifestyle business or you know some sort of affiliate marketing offer, some sort of make money online offer, and you're uh, adhering to freedom, you better throw some palm trees in there or your, a picture of you riding an elephant or something because these guys who buy those products want that level of freedom, I want you to exemplify it. The next one is the Rebel. The rebel is all about revolution. So revolution or uh, just anarchy or you know being an individual less so than the creator who is all about kind of being the center of attention. But the, um, the rebel is all about being individualistic and not, a, not in the status quo. They're very contrarian in nature. So the rebel is, appeals to those people who are kind of dissatisfied with their lives and want to want to change, but they are dissatisfied in the sense that they really don't like whatever is going on in their lives. And the best brand for that one in terms of big brands is Harley Davidson. Obviously, the leather, the uh, the type of advertising they have, even advertising to women, they show powerful women riding their own motorbikes and all that kind of stuff. So. The, the rebel is all about being that individualistic person who doesn't adhere to the normal rules. Now, uh, the next one is the lover, which is passion, sex, affection, things like that. Because the lover appeals to a very carnal desire in people, which is to procreate and duplicate themselves. So the lover is one that is also very taboo in a lot of ways. Like you don't see a lot of lover brands towards men. But one of the good examples of a lover brand towards men is Calvin Klein. Calvin Klein appeals to that sexy guy 
who actually wants to be viewed as sexy, perhaps the person who works out a lot or the male model or the person who was always seen as attractive when they were younger. That's a good example of a male version, but the obvious female version is Victoria's Secret. It's completely 100% built on feeling sexy and feeling that you are desired. And that is the lover archetype. The next one is the magician. The magician is actually less of a, and we'll talk about this and the difference between the magician and the sage, but the magician is the person who, unlike the creator, is the actual storyteller. It's not about them as a magician. It's about the story that they tell, the knowledge that they have, or the fantasy that they can create. And while being less about them, they're still seen as the person who tells those stories, the person who has the keeper of the knowledge, or some sort of labyrinthian understanding of things. Now, knowledge is different from wisdom, and we will talk about that in a second, but the best brand that exemplifies the idea of the magician is Disney. And Disney loves to tell stories. They love to tell stories that everybody adheres to. They also ha are in the entertainment business in, in several different ways. They make movies, they have theme parks, all that kind of stuff. But the entire idea isn't like this Elitch Gardens thing where there's a bunch of just rides and... Uh, roller coasters and, and terror drops and all that kind of stuff. Everything Disney does has that hint of fantasy or has that hint of magic. And it's the story that's being told around all those things that make it that much more powerful. That's what the magician does. Some examples of the magician in um, business like direct response marketing are the people who have those hidden tactics or secret tactics that they go out and find. You know, the magician is the secret, um, the brand new secret SEO trick that if you implement will get your videos ranked on page one in two minutes or something. That's the magician in direct response internet marketing context. But overall, Disney is a good example of having that fantasy. The next one is the ruler. Now the ruler is power, straight up. They are the king, they exemplify power, and a good example of that is Rolex, but again, go with anything that exemplifies power. Rolls Royce, Bentley, um, the the Lux at in or the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, uh, Trump is an example. All of Trump's brands exemplify power and wealth. That's what the ruler is all about. And the ruler is, is pretty is pretty simple. Either you're appealing to people who want power or you're not. Next one is the jester. So the jester is all about entertainment, but also funny entertainment. I used Old Spice as a brand here to describe it where all there's ads, you know, where the guy's riding a horse and diamonds are pouring out of his hands and, you know, things are growing out of people's armpits. It's entertaining. It's funny. But other brands have done it too, like Dollar Beard Club, the uh, Dollar Shave Club. There's a new brand of coffee that run, is run by veterans who uses the same style. So this sort of entertainment slash marketing is built into this jester archetype that a lot of people really love and tends to go really viral because what do people want? What are the two things that go most viral? If you can answer that, I'll give you a cookie, but I'm just going to give you the answer right now. The two things that go most viral are outrageous things, things that make people super, super angry and really entertaining things, people, things that make people laugh or uh, are entertained in some way. Those are the two things that go most viral. Outrage and funniness. And so you can see why instead of being an outrageous brand, which some people do, go read Ryan Holiday's book, Trust Me, I'm Lying, and you'll find out about that. But the, the jester is all about funniness and entertainment. And the last one here, I know this was a long one, we've been sitting on the slide for a while, is the sage. The sage is different from the magician because while the magician has access to specific knowledge that nobody else does, the sage has, actu has access to wisdom, has actu access to experience and context and much larger uh, bits of information so that instead of having one tactic, they have an entire library full of understanding and context. And with the sage, one of the best brands that exemplifies that is The Economist, the magazine, The Economist. They publish every single week and they have amazing editorial on the entire world when they do it. They show wisdom, they show context, they show a wealth of information. 
Wall Street Journal is another good example of the sage. And in marketing or in direct response, something you might be familiar with, the example of the stage, uh, the sage would be Jay Abraham. He exemplifies wisdom and cross-industry understanding of everything. So when you look back and you see these archetypes, innocent hero, regular guy, nurturer, creator, explorer, rebel, lover, magician, ruler, jester, and sage, you can usually put every single business you know into a box that fits this role. And usually the ones that are the most successful are the ones that have taken that role and run with it. And the ones that are failing are the ones who try to be more than one role or don't actually adhere to the role that they've been assigned by people. So you can assign yourself one of these very easily, but also when you're working with clients, try to understand what the target market perceives your company to be, or if they haven't perceived them as anything yet, try to find the core of what your client wants to be and then build from there. It's gonna help people put it in their mental box easier. All right. Let's move on to the foundation of story. So the foundation of story, there's five pieces to, to a story. And what we're gonna do here is talk about these pieces and then we're gonna talk about how to build the story and really go into some of the details, right? Put it all together. So let's talk about foundation of story, right? There are three foundational pieces to a story. Character, desire, and conflict. That's it. You have to have a solid character, which is almost always your prospect or the person your prospect wants to be. A desire, which is primal desire, just like we talked about in the previous trainings. And conflict, the things that, the primal pains, the the, the things that are holding the, your, your client back or your prospect back, that's the conflict. The next part is create a movie in your audience's mind. As I said earlier in this training, they don't want to be informed, they want to be entertained. And if you can educate them while entertaining them, all the better. But you gotta create the story in their mind first. The reason for that is because they will tune out so easily if they're not enraptured by your story. So start that story early, if not right at the very beginning of your, of your sales piece. Once you've started to realize that that's what you have to do with your sales messages, pick your archetype and link your archetype. The either use a Jungian one, use a one of Sally Hogsheads, use one of the common ones that you see, whatever it is, just pick one. But you have to link it to the aspirational prospect. So this isn't your prospect as they are. This is your prospect as they wish to be. So in Frank Kern's case, he's the hometown boy made good. So that made good part is really, really important because if he was just a hometown boy, then no one would listen to him because he hasn't done anything yet. But when he rolls up in a, BM, in a BMW and says, actually, I just rented this for this video, this is my car, and then rolls out a Rolls Royce, that's the aspirational prospect. That's the archetype that your guy wants to be. You know, he would love to see himself making videos like that, making fun of internet marketing while selling the crap out of internet marketing. Now, the next thing is once you've picked your archetype as the aspirational prospect, you need to pick your primal desire. This is obvious. Um, the primal desire is part of the research that you do for the big four. And the next thing is you've got to pick your big problem. So character, desire, and conflict. Creating the movie in the audience's mind to create a character, pick your archetype as an aspirational version of your prospect. As a desire, pick your primal desire. And as a conflict, pick your big problem. This is not your big idea. This is your big problem. This is the thing that your client or prospect thinks that they're that is their biggest struggle. And once you know this, you can help them overcome it. Now, build your story. So let's talk about how you build your story, right? How do you want, oh, I misspelled a word here, apologize in advance. How do you want, how do I want the life of my prospect to change? Think, the, think about that, write that down in your notes. How do I want the life of my prospect to change? Do they get freedom? Do they get wealth? Do they get health? Do they get peace of mind? What is it? Connection or courage? All these different things, all the different things that either appeal to their primal desire and also link themselves to that aspirational version of their prospect, that archetype. So your hero that you write the story for, whether it's you, your client, or some random uh, person that you invented for the sales message, 
they must long for or need the exact same thing that your prospect wants and needs. So if your if your prospect wants to lose 45 pounds before their wedding, then your hero must also want to lose 45 or 50 pounds before her wedding. That's that's the most important thing here. They must have the exact same desire. Let's move on here. What problem does the product solve, right? Is it too little money, too fat, uh, not smart enough? Again, man, typos. Uh, not smart enough, a lack of knowledge, uh, a lack of success, a lack of fulfillment. What What's the problem? What is what is the problem that the, pro that the product solves? This is relevant for even the most aware audiences. If the audience doesn't have an idea of what their what problem that you're trying to solve for them, then they're not going to pay attention, especially to a sales message like this. So once you write your story and you understand what the problem is that the product solves, your hero of the story must suffer from the exact same problem, if not worse than the target than the target market. I recently wrote a VSL for a client that was a VSL for a language learning program. And that language learning program was a really cool program that allowed people to learn languages quicker, but the hook was that the person teaching it suffered from bipolar disorder. And bipolar disorder made him manic and depressed, and the, the depressive stage meant he couldn't study and memorize stuff, and the manic stage meant he couldn't remember anything what he, that he studied during the time. So his way of learning was impossible for the normal methods of learning language, and therefore, he invented a new one that works way better. And it was a great story, great compelling story. Um, if your hero suffers from the same problem that the uh, client or the prospect has, or suffers from a worse problem that is the same as them but worse, then you've got a good story. So what need or desire does the product or message fulfill? These are all questions you need to answer yourself. Answer for yourself. So write these down as you're build as you're building your story. So once you've built the foundation of your story and you've picked character, desire, and conflict, start answering these questions for yourself. How do I want the life of my prospect to change? Your hero must long for the same thing. What problem does the product solve? Your hero must suffer from the same problem. What need or desire does my product or message fulfill? Right, the need or desire. This is your primal desire. This is the thing you already picked out. And what is the manifestation of that primal desire? So that their subconscious primal desire is something that they don't even really articulate to themselves. But what is the externalization, the manifestation of that primal desire? Is it money? Is it popularity? Is it a competitive edge against their competitors in business or, or in their workplace? Is it success? Is it contribution like the core needs we talk about or travel or more family time? What is it? You got to figure out what that manifestation is. And the hero needs to want the same things. So you need to tie that into your story as well. You see what we're doing here? As we're telling a story, we're weaving in the pieces of good sales copy. Next one is, what action do I want my buyer to take? Now here's a cool little tip that you can throw into your story depending on how your market reacts to certain things. If your market is very aspirational, then you can have your hero take the action and get the benefits. So that means that you know that you're, if your audience is more prone to taking action on stuff, then you show them the hero taking action and getting the result that they want, which just further spurs them on to take action. But if your audience is skeptical, or if your audience is one that doesn't like to buy stuff, then you can show your hero not taking action and suffering the consequences of that. So this person that they've personified as themselves in your story, all of a sudden fails to take the right action, quote unquote, and fails because of it, suffers the consequences, does not get what he wants and sometimes watches his peers succeed before him or her. This is very powerful stuff. So your hero must either take the action and get the benefits or fail to take the action and suffer the consequences. And this is based on whether your audience is intrinsically action taking or positive or optimistic versus skeptical or cynical and non-action taking. So if it's the first one, do the first one. If it's the second one, do the second one. So again, you always want to know what you're trying to drive people to do in the sales piece. So what are you trying to drive them to do 
and then talk about your hero either taking or not taking that action. So that was a lot of information. Okay, let's do a really quick recap of what we just talked about and then we'll put it all together. First, we talked about the hero's journey and exactly what it is, right? The three acts, act one, act two, and act three are all right here. Then I talked about the myth of the hero's journey and the reality of how stories are constructed and why they're constructed that way. We gave you some resources in tvtropes.org and some ideas around it on how to craft your own stories and how to tell those stories. So, and then I implore you, remember, there is no sandbox when doing this stuff. Results are all that matter. So just because you didn't write in the template doesn't mean you can't get the results. I talked about archetypes, not only common archetypes, some resources you can have, but all of the Jungian archetypes, which are the basis for pretty much everything else. And once you've got that, you've got the foundations of your story, which are character, desire, and conflict, and you've got the exact steps on how to build those things, and you've got a set of four questions on how to build your story, right? How do I want the prospect of my life to change? What problem does a product solve? What needs or desires of my product or message fulfill? And what action do I want my buyer to take? And I talked to you about how, what the hero is supposed to do in each one of those instances. So let's put it all together. Step one, go through all of your research. The big four and your big idea. Get it all out of the way. Get all your research out of the way. Understand your target market. Know what their primal desire, primal fear, and core needs are. Know what the awareness is of the market you're targeting and the sophistication of the market overall. And once you've got all that and you've got a good big idea for your piece, that is step one, okay? Step two, go through the product. So once you've got all of your research on what is supposed to happen with this client and his market and, and all that kind of stuff, go through the product. See what they're teaching, whether it's a video series, a book, maybe it's a physical product and you gotta play with it like a drone or a shirt or something like that. Go through it, learn it inside and out. Then, once you've done both of those things, done your research, gone through the product, now you start the storytelling process. Step three, pick the hero's archetype. If you have a client, and their story is relevant to the, the information or the product that they're selling, use the client because it adds more authority to the story when you're talking about the actual creator's story in the product. If the client doesn't have a specific story, you can use a testimonial. And if they don't have a story or a testimonial, you can use a fictional story similar to the uh, two men story for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, you actually did this as one of your writing assignments, but the Wall Street Journal ran the ad where two men uh, started in the same place, got the same job, but then one of them retired as the CEO and one of them retired as a junior manager. The difference was the Wall Street Journal. That's the story. It was completely fictional, obviously, but it was extremely effective. So number one choice, client story. Number two, testimonial. And number three, if you don't have those first two, Make something up, obviously within ethical reason. Step four, answer the foundational questions, the four foundational questions. And we talked about this before and what the hero is supposed to do in this context. How do I want the life of my prospect to change? What problem does this product solve? What need or desire does my product fulfill? And what action do I want my buyer to take? So step five, Pick your plot. So um, the plot oftentimes is done for you if you have a client or a testimonial for your story. Now your job instead of creating a story is to, um, instead of creating the story like a fictional story, your, your job is to pick out the really interesting parts of your client's or the testimonial's story. So instead of just saying it the way that they said it, um, again, referencing the language VSL because it's on the top of my head, the, the context around that was uh, I was trying to find the right hook and the right story and I learned about the fact that he was bipolar and he created this when he was going through post-grad, but it wasn't anywhere in his marketing. And I'm like, wow, that is an amazing hook. We have to use that. That's where you have to find it in your client's story or the testimonial's story. 
The next one is if it's fictional. So the easiest way to do this in your copy, if you're writing a fictional story, is to talk about what I call the crazy uncle. So this is the, the person that your target market can relate to, uh, but is not specific to your client or a testimony or anything like that, but it's close enough that it's believable. So if your client is a person, they're selling an information product, and they had this crazy uncle that just discovered this amazing way to earn money online, then that's more believable than you know this random story that you have to make up off the top of your head. Just connect it to them somehow. Also, if your market is highly sophisticated, like a financial market or a uh, health market for a lot of big offers, supplements, things like that, then use TV tropes over here and just make something up if you're making up a fictional story because it has a story generator for you. Let's use an example here. Ancient Africa. The setting is ancient Africa in Egypt or the Upper Nile. And in the Upper Nile, the Egyptians had an elixir that they would drink that has been lost to history. But that elixir purportedly made them healthy, made them live longer than everyone else in the region by up to 50 years, kept them very healthy during that time, and was cultivated from a very simple plant that was grown right there in the Nile. So that was lost to history, but it has recently been found by a person who went and interviewed some of the tribal uh, Bedouins who were in that area walking around ancient Africa. The plot is who done it to me. So the, the plot that we're talking about here outside of the setting is I went to interview the Bedouins for a journalistic thing and I saw them drinking a tea that I had no idea what they did, but I asked the guy how old he was. He said 98 and he looked 60. Or, and he looked 50 and this is a man who lived a hard life but once I grabbed once I once I got this recipe from him a mysterious man uh, actually stole the recipe from me or something to that effect right narrative device the mercy lead I actually don't know what that is but we're generating the story here for a supplement immediately using something very easy to use right the villain is the swarm maybe the crop was wiped out by locusts and remember, we're making up a story here, but it's very compelling. The hero is a horrifying hero, like Quasimodo. Um, so, like, you know, I was not the healthiest guy. I was not the, the most good-looking guy. And I didn't have the greatest genetics for longevity. And so I heard about this drink, and I'm like, hey, you know what? I'm going to give it a shot, or something like that. Character is a device, Baker Street regular. I don't know what that is either. Uh, character, is, uh, character depth, I don't know what any of this is. But you see, the story generator has created for me a fictional narrative that is extremely compelling if you're trying to sell some skinny tea or whatever it is, right? It's a great story to build off of and it's just right here for you and there's just dozens of them. I can just keep hitting the button and it keeps creating them for me and I just try to be a little bit creative around it. All right, that is what you do for step five. Oh, pick your plot. <laughs> uh, pick your plot, not your piece of the slide apparently. And number, uh, step six, start telling the story. And this goes without saying, but I have to say it just so nobody tries to do something crazy. Um, adjust it for time, medium, channel, and purpose. So time, meaning how much time do you have? Do you have a 30 second ad? Do you have five seconds during the pre-roll of a YouTube ad that is going to let you tell a very specific thing and then you've got you know, a minute or two of someone's attention after that if they stay. Uh, the medium, is it YouTube, is it Facebook, is it in print, is it on uh, direct mail, is it via radio, whatever, what's the medium, right? And the channel is the same thing, so how are you communicating that message? And the purpose, are you going for something free or are you trying to make someone pay for tickets to a $10,000 seminar out in Bali? The purpose matters in this story and the, that allows you to adjust everything. So adjust the story for time, medium, channel, and purpose. Here's an example. If you've got a 30 second ad, then you start in the ordinary world in your uh, hero's journey. You have a call to action and the refusal. So this is what happens. So if you are a small business owner who, uh, who is bleeding sales and you do not do this, this is what will happen. Hi, I'm Lucas Roszewski, and I help small business owners plug their sales leaks 
in all in their business rapidly and and guaranteed. Now click this button to come with me to see exactly how I would do this. There you go, 30 second ad, slapped it right on there. Um, the, the context is very simple, but it's also very specific to exactly what you are doing. So adjust the story and the stuff you're using for the time, medium, channel, and purpose that you are writing the story for. Next step, uh, oh, uh, template. Template plus persuasion boosts. So using a sales template here is going to help you because once you've told your story, once you've you know sat down with someone in the chair next to them and told this story, then you're gonna wanna make sure you hit normal psychological persuasion triggers throughout the story. And you gotta weave those in. So what I would recommend doing is instead of ruining the story by throwing a template on it first, write the entire story using the hero's journey, using you know something from TV tropes, using the client's story, whatever it is, write the whole thing. And then once that's done, lay a sales template over it and start adding the things that you missed or that you could shore up or anything like that. It's the easiest way to build a, a coherent sales message while also keeping the, the core of the story. Next thing is, value stack throughout the story. This is a persuasion boost that I like to use in the stories that I write where I'm constantly giving the audience a benchmark of value throughout the story. So I will say, um, again, <laughs> referencing the language VSL, uh, I will say that, you know, as a university student in my sixth year of post-grad, uh, I had already spent blank amount of money and I just wasn't learning anything. And so that amount of money was essentially wasted, even though I was trying really, really hard to do it. You might have the same experience if you're trying to learn a language in a four-year university and you ha can't remember a word from the first year. And that cost you $100,000 and it's looking like even more. And then I you know, traveled and I, just, and I lost my job, which was this much money per year because I couldn't speak the language in a foreign country. And that was this much. And so you value stack throughout the story and, and lay down a really specific price for not only for failure, but also for success. Like this is what I had to go through in order to succeed. And if you want to do the same thing and follow my footsteps, you're going to have to do the same thing and spend this amount of time and this amount of money in order to do it yourself. So if you value stack throughout the story and then you drop the price at the end and say, look, you could either do what I did for the last six years and spend $100,000 on school and you know almost kill yourself, or you can buy my $97 product and not have to deal with any of that and get all the benefits. It's a compelling thing if you value stack through the story. Last step, step eight, test, tweak, and optimize like anything in copywriting. Look, a story is not a panacea. It's wonderful. It's a great way to keep people's attention and it's a great way to break up the monotony of all these stupid templates you see everywhere. But at the end of the day, it's still sales copy. And you have to test it, you have to tweak it, and you have to optimize it. Testing it, send traffic to it, make sure you're sending the right traffic no matter where it is, whether it's an email, cold traffic, physical product, whatever. Test to make sure the traffic is right. Then tweak. Have your analytics ready. How many people are watching the video? How long do they watch it for? Do they drop it off? Drop off at certain points? What's going on? How do we tweak this? What you know? Where is the sales message losing them? What can we shore up? All this kind of fancy stuff. And then optimize. So maybe it's converting great, but you want the front end to convert better. So instead of thirty percent of your viewers staying on uh, for the first minute, you want it to be forty percent. How do you improve that? How do you optimize that? Do you try different hooks? Do you try different story leads? Do you have to, what do you do? That's the test tweak and optimize phase. Um, we've talked about that in previous modules, but those are the steps. Let's run back through them really quick. Step one, go through all the research. Step two, go through the product. Step three, pick your hero archetype and then choose from these three options in descending order. Step four, Answer the four foundational questions. I've gone over these a lot, so I'm not gonna say them again. Step five, pick your plot. If it's fictional, use TV tropes or go with the crazy uncle story. Step six, tell the story in the appropriate way for the medium you're using. Step seven, use a sales template after you've created the story so that you don't miss important persuasion triggers and value stack throughout the story.
in order to boost persuasion or boost your success. And the last one, do not forget about this. Never ever don't do this. <laughs> like, like don't don't ever just run away from your client at the end of the project. You always want to stay on for testing, tweaking, and optimization because your best clients are going to want it and the shitty clients aren't going to use it. But you always want to be known as the copywriter who's going to stick around and help things get better as they go. So that was module seven, storytelling. It's been a long time coming. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you have any questions on it, bring it to the Q&A calls or uh, ask in the group. And I appreciate your time and attention. As always, have a wonderful day.